Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the CPD today. My name is Dr. Moatia from the Kenya Association of Pediatric Dentists. We're going to allow approximately five minutes to allow more people to join in. So we should be starting by 7.05. Um, on camera is Dr. Nitesh, our presenter, whom I shall be introducing once we start. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, you can just type out in the chat which country you come from. You can type out in the chat which country you come from if you're not from Kenya and we can welcome you. Excellent, Dr. Nisha from Kenya. <laughs> nice to see you. Oh, Saudi Arabia. Thank you, Rahaf. We have participants from Nigeria, welcome. Oh, we have a Sharon from the United Kingdom, welcome. I see more participants from Nigeria, you're very welcome. So it's now a five minutes past seven. We hoped to start now, but we'll allow a few more minutes. We are about 187 and we just want to get the number to 200 and then Dr. Nitesh will introduce you and you can start.
So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Marjorie Moasia from the Kenya Association of Pediatric Dentists. We wish to welcome you to our continuing professional development this Thursday evening. Um, we welcome Kenyan and also international participants. So far we have from Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UK, and, and um, feel very welcome to our presentation this evening. Um, if you have any questions, kindly place them in the Q&A and we shall attend to them at the end of the presentation. Um, KAPD, as you know, is a group of uh, pediatric dentists, basically an association that was formed in order to further education, research, and even clinical care in, in uh, dentistry with regards to children from birth to adolescence. And we also include persons with special health care needs. Um, this evening, Dr. Nitesh, we have an uh, undergraduate, postgraduate, interns, dentists, specialists, we have pediatricians, A&D doctors, so everyone is here because our version is not only limited to dentists but is experienced at community level and even in the accident and emergency. So we look forward to hearing uh, from you. So I'll um, introduce... Um, Dr. Nitesh, give me one minute so that I get your names correct. So Dr. Nitesh Tewari comes to us from, as an associate professor from the All Indian Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi. Um, the facility where he works is under the Ministry of Health in India. Um, he's the Joint Secretary of the Indian Society of Dental Traumatology, and he sits on the Standing Committee for the International Association of Dental Traumatology, which means, Dr. Nitesh, we are going to hear material from 2020. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So he likes to say he's an academician and researcher and obviously with great interest in the area of dental injuries. So... Dr. Nitesh, you're most welcome. Kindly proceed. Thank you, Dr. Majori, uh, for the kind introduction. And uh, very thankful to everybody who has joined in for this webinar from different parts of the world, not just Kenya, but different countries as you can see. Uh, I am Dr. Nitesh Tiwari, and I work as Associate Professor in All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And today I will be talking about, about one of the most difficult parts of dental trauma, which is management of uh, vision. And as I move on in the next 40 minutes, I will be speaking more or less in a, a clinical perspectives, which are not too boring. And I will be showing some of the success stories and, and some of the cases which actually failed because it's an uncomfortable uh, paradigm. And first of all, uh, Uh, I would like to thank the Kenya Association of Pediatric Dentists, especially my friend Dr. Aisha, Dr. Bhuvi, Dr. June, and Dr. Munayo, and everybody who has uh, put their efforts towards organizing this particular webinar. So we were in communications since a month, and then we decided to have it in first week of August. So uh, here we are now talking about the region. So this is the country which I am from, and uh, that is in southern part of Asia, not too far from Kenya. And uh, it's, it's it's many times uh, in news for good and bad reasons, and this is this is the cultural diversity which my country has uh, full of colors. And uh, with, uh, with one, one particular monument which the country is known for is the Taj Mahal. So it's one of the seven wonders of the world. And we have people from different faiths. We have people from different cultures living in, in uh, this diverse nation. Sorry, Dr. Nitesh, may I interrupt you? Could you um? adjust your mouthpiece so that we can hear you a bit better. Is it fine now? That's better. Let's just right. do a check. Okay, is it fine? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Perfectly fine. Okay. So this is the this is the city which I live in and presently I'm speaking from. That's Delhi. It's the capital city of uh, of India and it it has got a history of around uh, more than a thousand years. So, so, uh, and it's a mix of history and uh, and the modernity, so, and and it has got immense uh, industrial facilities and research institutes. So, so it's it's a good place to live in. 
Um, and then uh, this is the institute where I work. Like Dr. Majori said, it's uh, it's the Apex Institute run by Government of India, and it was established more than 60 years ago, and uh, it, it it caters to large number of patients uh, from the medical and dental uh, causes, and that amounts to around more than 50,000 patients uh, almost in a day. So that, that's quite a huge number which which comes in. And then in this institute, there are around seven speciality centers and the dental center, the building where I'm, I'm sitting right now. So that's the Center for Dental Education and Research. It's also a World Health Organization's uh, collaborating center for oral health promotion. So that's, that's an accreditation which we have. Uh, and, and we are also the National Center for Research and uh, Referral for Higher Dental Studies. So that's primarily uh, an, an APEX research institute. I, I hope I'm audible now. Yeah. So we're proceeding to, to one of the two associations which, which I am affiliated with. So there is one association called Indian Society of Dental Traumatology, which we formed in 2017. And it's, it has got more than 400 members there. And we have had a couple of conferences and we even had uh, the president of International Association of Dental Traumatology uh, with us in one of the conferences in Chennai in 2019. It's a good association uh, that, that uh, we work for, for clinical research and uh, clinical practice for dental trauma. And that's the international counterpart, the second association, which I want um, my attention to be shown. So that's the International Association of Dental Traumatology. So that's the body which, which formulates the guidelines and which tells you the, you know, the highest uh, evidence. Their journal is Dental Traumatology, which is a dream for all the people who are working in clinical and dental uh, research for trauma specific causes. So that's that that that's the brief intro introduction and moving on to the topic which I want to talk about. Uh, it's the quick emergency. Of, it's actually the first emergency. So the people who are there in the medical uh, fraternity who are listening to me, it's mostly the first reason that the patient is usually brought to an ER or the emergency room. Then because the patient is, is usually two years or three years old and he or she, uh, she is very panicked. They or she is crying forcefully. The parents are panicked. The parents are guilty because uh, that they are young parents and they have never seen blood in their child or never seen their child in such a situation. So that that's an emergency uh, which uh, we know of avulsion. And then the one thing which avulsion is is also very problematic is that uh, it, its prognosis is quite questionable. And every time that we are trying to salvage the tooth and trying to reduce the problems of that particular patient. And ultimately, we rely on some of the guidelines and we rely on the treatment methods which have been proven. But many a times, there is still unpredictability. And, and unpredictability is also the which we are facing in, in whole of the world and because of the novel corona or COVID-19 situation. But even that situation also warrants us to attend the emergencies like dental avulsion. So if you are working in a private practice in, in your part of the world and you know that there is an avulsion patient and who has called you, it's your duty to attend that. So you cannot just stay away from your, your clinical practice because of, uh, um, of the scare of, uh, of COVID-19 because uh, avulsions usually do not require too much of uh, aerosol generating process. And with basic PPE, it's, it's your duty to, to perform those emergency procedures. And it's an it's a guideline which was given by ADA in around April. So so that's April 2020 guideline, and it has not in, and not been revised after that. So that that even says that if it, if the patient has a tooth avulsion, so that's an emergency, and you are supposed to attend it wherever you are in the world. And, and you cannot deny it because any movement or any second lost for tooth aversion is actually a big problem because that, that has a, got a detrimental effect upon the prognosis of the tooth and it has got some, some serious effect upon, upon the psychology of the child patient because that's one part of the body which is going to be lost. And, and if, if as a medical practitioner, you think that, that if the tooth has been thrown away in a dustbin or and if the child has lost a single tooth, it doesn't matter much, but it does. It's a body part of a of a ten year old boy or ten year old girl which has gone missing, and that's that's as as good as missing a finger. So so people are are without it for a long period of time, and they have to undergo procedures after procedures to have that tooth restored, which is still not as good as it should have been. So so that's that's a serious problem which we feel with dental trauma. And if you can just just look into uh, this 
this particular patient. If you, it's a child, it's a child of around three years, which which had a fall from the roof of the building, and he was brought to us uh, with, with the with the loss of the tooth. And the tooth, since the parents were not aware of how it should be stored and what should be the next thing which should be done. So after ruling out any of the CNS problems, any of the bleeds from the nose, any of the uh, loss of consciousness, or any of the amnesia uh, related symptoms. You, the patient is here with us, but but as per the guidelines, we, we are not supposed to, uh, to re-implant and avoid primary tooth because of the, uh, the the risk of its aspiration into the respiratory canal. So, so the, the, the treatment for these patients is generally just to leave it like this and uh, reduce the chances of any foreign body there, reduce the chances of any infection. We will be dealing into details of these guidelines and we will be talking about the 2020 guidelines also, which we had a webinar last evening. And if, if the, the picture which is very unique in this case is look at the tears in that uh, in those eyes and uh, usually we are supposed to cover the eyes when we are doing presentations but i want you to see those eyes those uh, those eyes are uh, eyes of a four-year-old boy who had lost two of the teeth and he had a trauma which which was unprecedented and unwarranted so it's not a disease like dental caries it's not a disease like any respiratory problem or any infection it's a trauma, it's an emergency, and you can see that in the eyes of that child. So, so that's the situation which we are dealing with, and as a dentist and as a medical practitioner, you are supposed to take serious efforts so that you can reduce the problems which the child is faced. And then if we move on to, um, to the cases where we have permanent teeth which are lost, so I would take you through uh, the timeline of this particular patient, which we had around a week ago. So we did this patient with, uh, with the present COVID-19 pandemic, and we have had been facing uh, avulsions uh, almost every week. And we have been doing patients on, because our trauma center is also linked with, with our dental center. So if you observe, the patient is uh, around 10 years of age and he has had some lacerations in the lip which has been repaired in the emergency room and the patient had brought the teeth which were permanent teeth uh, wrapped in the newspaper or wrapped in, the, in, the, in his arithmetic, in mathematics textbook. So you can imagine the plight of that particular child. He must have been playing in the park and then he had a fall and, and this was the severity of the injury that the two of the front teeth, they were lost. And those front teeth, because the parents or the people who were around him, they were not aware how to preserve those teeth. They were wrapped in the in the in the whatever thing they could get get because but they had the the knowledge that they, the teeth should not be thrown away. That that's again important. But the problem was that the patient had got injury around 8 p.m. Uh, previous day. So that's a, a time lapse of around 12 hours. But he's still a child of 10 years. That's what the guideline says. You should try and save the tooth. So we will. I will take you towards the timeline of this patient. You will observe that it's 10 a.m. and the child has been brought to our operatory. And as we move forward, we took the quick history, which was just recorded. What was the CNS symptoms and what was the um, whether there was any loss of uh, consciousness or any vomiting, amnesia, any bleed from the nose. We were ruled out, and then we took clinical photographs. We did the examination. We 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 checked what whether they were what was the extent of soft tissue trauma. What was the extent of heart issue trauma and where, how were the teeth which were in the proximity and after that with the next if you see at around 10 7 a.m that the patient had been brought around 10 a.m it's 10 7 and we took a quick radiograph which is around the two or three angulations which are needed because we want to rule out any other associated injury you will observe that in the in the middle the the, the radiograph that's the that the IOPA which is uh, uh, in the parallel view and you will observe that it's a clean socket not much of the fracture which can be seen in the bone so it was a case confirmed for the avulsion with no fracture in the associated in uh, in the adjacent teeth. So in around 10 a.m., so that's a parallel team. It's a team approach. One team is dealing with the patient. The other team is preparing the tooth. So in the, in the terms of tooth preparation, that's the 10 a.m. tooth, which has been wrapped in a, in a mathematics textbook paper. It has been, uh, now the 2020 guideline says that you should not wash it with water. You should instead agitate it in, in a solution of a saline or any of the uh, storage media. So we used saline. We put the tooth inside that particular saline um, water and then we slightly agitated it so that, uh, that, that it gets clean. And then what we did, since it, it's, it's a trauma, uh, which is um, it's around 10 a.m., 10 1, 
and then around 10 5 we removed all the periodontal ligament which was attached to that particular tooth it's around 10 uh, hours which has gone gone past the injury and now the tooth uh, the periodontal ligament are not supposed to be viable so if you leave the periodontal ligament right now they will cause some foreign body reactions once you place the tooth back into the socket so what we did and what the guideline says is you remove the entire periodontal ligament. The 2020 guideline do not ask us to, to do an extra oral RCT, but in this case, we were not sure of the prognosis. So we stuck to 2012 guideline, which said that if there is an extra oral guy, uh, dry time of more than uh, 60 minutes, you should do uh, perform an extra oral RCT. So we did an excess opening. You can see the timeline is 10, six, six minutes past the, the patient was brought to our operatory. It's 10, 10. We did the extirpation of the pulp using our uh, normal K files. Uh, we took, the, um, we, we, we did not require a working length estimation. We could do an um, uh, assessment and this is the metapex or calcium hydroxide iodoform paste placed inside that particular tooth at around the same time around 10 13 a.m and side by side if you if you observe right after the radiograph was taken and we had confirmed that the socket was clear we used a periosteal elevator that's that's what uh, dr andreasen um, used in uh, in his textbook he recommended that uh, a periosteal elevator the blunt end should be taken inside the sharp end should be taken inside gently so that you can rule out out that there is no uh, bone fracture and if there is a bone fracture which is collapsed from the buccal cortex you can replace it that's 10 10 a.m and then we used saline to irrigate the socket irrigation is important because we need to remove the foreign body and since the the time elapses more than 60 minutes we also need to remove the coagulum so that coagulum needs to be removed that's just one minute the quick fire um, saline irrigation and then around uh, four minutes past uh, um, and the, that irrigation uh, we, we had a team which was which had prepared the tooth with uh, with the extra oral placement of the calcium hydroxide iodoform paste and around four minutes um, after um, the, the cleaning of the coagulum uh, we, we placed the tooth back inside and as we place it it's not forced inside it's a gentle digital pressure that is used and it is moved slightly gently inside. Then, then at the same time, we place the another tooth within a minute, it's inside. And then we take the patient back to the x-ray and we take an RVG, which is around 10, 16 a.m. So we need to be quick. We need to be um, uh, fast because even though it's, it's beyond 60 minutes, that also doesn't allow you to have too much of liberty with the time. You need to keep a time in check. So if you if you uh, if you talk about the next procedures, as soon as the, the, the radiograph was taken for that particular replacement or implantation, the next step is 10:16 a.m. where we we take we, we place the agent. So agent means that we are now going to splint the tooth. The splinting recommended by IADT in 2020 guideline is by the use of 0.4 millimeter uh, stainless steel wire or even the nylon grip especially in the patients who do not have uh, too much of the primary teeth. So we place the agent, that's the simplest technique and that can be done by anyone in clinical dentistry in any part of the world. Agent is placed around middle third of the tooth on the label surface. Then we apply bonding agent, two minutes, the, the, it has been cleaned, washed, bonding agent has been applied. If you observe, there's a, there a finger around here. A yeah, finger is there so that the tooth is there in the position and there is a team working for it. And within a minute, we do the curing. We start the curing from one end to another. If you observe in this particular patient, um, you will observe that the etching has been done even for the primary canine. Primary canine, the permanent lateral incisor, the permanent central incisor, and the contralaterals. You will observe that we have expanded the, the, the uh, ligation because there was some mobility or subluxation in the lateral incisors as well. So what the next is 1020 and we, we are done with the bonding agent curing and then we place the wire which is a braided wire around 0.3 millimeter stainless steel we use ligature wires which are braided into uh, into a double um, uh, spool and then we place it as soon as we place it we start the the curing session we place the the flowable composite uh, around two to three millimeter thickness or two to three millimeter um, blob of the composite is placed on the, on each tooth and that is cured side by side so we have multiple people of the team working for it and then within a minute we start the curing further and within a few more minutes it's it's done and so within um, if you will see that it's 10 7 a.m where the x-ray was taken 10 a.m the patient was brought to us 10 16 a.m we had done the re-implantation and confirmed that that the tooth is black to the former position and within within few more minutes it's 
it's done. So it's it's a procedure which which we have to uh, tame ourselves, we have to train ourselves, and we have to perform with the excellence. We have to perform with uh, with some speed, and and that that's a team which we work for for this. That that's our residents, and uh, and um, they were they were doing uh, working with uh, with with precision because they have been trained for it. And and if you will observe that it's a team approach. If one person is is holding the wire in place, there is another person who is putting the composite there, and there is a third person who is curing it. So the composite replacement and curing can be done by one person also, but more hands, it's it's better. And and if you will observe, it's the Corona times and the COVID-19 protocol has to be followed and, and the, the full PP has to be administered in, in almost all the cases because we are not testing the patients when they are coming to operatory. So we take the basic history and then we move on to the and that's the emergency protocol and that's our postgraduates who perform this treatment and 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 that that actually calls for the complexity because it's it's the complexity of two divergences that make it difficult and there are certain dilemmas which or which we always are faced with a, whether it's a, a, a new dentist who has uh, who has been uh, just out of its final year under graduation and into the internship or somebody who is experienced uh, with with a specialization, there are major dilemmas which which are associated with both emergency. So, what are these dilemma, dilemmas? The first dilemma or the first problem is: Are we doing it the, in the right manner? Are we doing it in in the right way? So that that's actually a, a big thing because unless and until you have been trained for it, unless and until you have your updation of the knowledge or you have learned some of the resources through webinars or through attending of the lectures or doing courses, you will not be able to understand whether your work was right or wrong and then uh, second is whether the uh, uh, why is the management of the tooth avulsion so unpredictable so even with best of our efforts like you saw in the previous case uh, it was a delayed implantation and with best of the efforts which our team did which we did we are not sure of, of how the things will be and how the things will be in future. So that's the unpredictability which we are always concerned. And third question is whether you can or you cannot re-implant an adverse primary tooth. That's again the third dilemma. And then what are the adverse consequences? What are the adverse consequences which can happen once we have re-implanted the permanent tooth into the socket? So that's again a problem. And then last is, and what are the solutions so that we can prevent those adverse consequences or we can we can manage the cases with adverse consequences in our clinics. So these are the dilemmas which we'll be covering in the next uh, around uh, 30 minutes or so. The first of the dilemma is, it's been very clearly answered, and if you if you believe in in the, the good practices, I really believe in the consensus based guidelines. This is one association which you should be looking at, even for the membership. It's International Association of Dental Traumatology. It it is known for its guidelines, and these guidelines are really very very well documented, and and uh, anybody in any part of the world can use it. So first of the guideline was given in 2001, and that was the first edition. It was then followed up by by something which which came in around 2007 and this was followed further by 2012 guidelines so so you can observe that periodically the, this this association and the board of directors they have committees and they they update the knowledge and the most recent addition um, uh, was uh, 2012 before the may of uh, 2020 this year so they have launched the new 2020 guidelines and the guidelines are are so well documented and so well received all over the world that the people from endo the people from pediatric dentistry they all believe in them and they they all adopt it in in their form so that's the webinar which has happened yesterday and then the chair of the committee was professor Lyron Levin from Canada and the, the uh, the coach uh, and and the person who, who introduced the webinar yesterday was Anne O'Connell, who is the president of uh, IADT. So that's the webinar which happened yesterday, and it was formally introduced uh, the differences between the 2020 and 2012 guidelines. And we will be discussing those differences as we move on. So what are, the point which I want to make is that if you want to be sure of your treatment protocol, always believe in guidelines. And what we do in our our uh, hospital is that. We have those guidelines uh, in, in printed form and we have them kept in the operatory. So the moment you your postgraduate or you attend a dental trauma, you go back and you uh, you read that guideline once more. Even if you are a, a master of dental trauma, you go back and read that guideline because you will find something new in that. Maybe you can get a research idea or maybe you can improve the dental trauma literature somehow. So that's that's the importance of guideline. And what guideline tells you is that there should be a first aid of adverse teeth. 
because these injuries especially the medical doctors who are listening to me so you you should you should always be aware that there will be patients calling you up because they do not know whether you you can manage or you cannot manage a tooth avulsion they will be calling you up for help they will be calling you up with phone calls and these days people call you up on whatsapp they will do video calls and it's it's quite good because then you can you can educate them what next what should be done so guideline tells you a basic first aid so first and foremost advice we should you should be giving is that you should keep calm you should not be panicked like the parents are you should be sounding that you are in control the first thing in the guideline is that yet you should always ensure that the patient patient's tooth is a permanent tooth and because the primary tooth are not supposed to be reimplanted as per the 2020 guidelines and and you should always ensure that by telling it to the parents there on phone call that it's it, what's the size of the tooth and if you are doing a video call it's a good idea especially in covid-19 situation because your clinic will be more prepared if you know what the situation so do a video call do speak to the patient just look at look at the situation ask them to check if if it has been accounted for the permanent tooth and then ask the patient to to pick the pick pick the tooth from the white part of the tooth whenever you are telling them we as a dentist know what is crown what is root but they do not know so you can you can use easy languages and you can you can tell that you hold the tooth by the white part without touching the root and this has to be followed by a gentle cleaning so what used to be uh, in previous 2012 guideline they used to say that you should wash the tooth in in the running water but right now what they are telling you is you should stay away from the water for all means and for cleaning of the foreign body if the tooth has fallen down into the playground or it has fallen down on the floor and the floor is dirty and you need to remove the foreign body you instruct the parents that you should clean it using milk in a, in a bowl of milk you can uh, they can place the tooth and they can slowly move it so that the tooth is clean and that is that has to be done briefly for 10 seconds and then once the tooth is reimplanted ask them to reimplant the tooth the medical doctors can also do it the parents can do it the sports teachers can do it patients can do it and if the tooth is reimplanted by by the patient themselves or the parents it's the best case scenario because you have reduced the extra oral dry time to zero and that's the immediate reimplantation the 2020 guidelines tell that if the reimplantation takes place within 15 minutes it should be regarded as immediate reimplantation reimplantation so that's the timeline they, which they have added in this version of the guideline and once the reimplantation has taken place they should play, place place a, a handkerchief or a hanky or a cotton ball there so that the tooth is in in place for for a longer duration before they can be brought to the operatory and then if in uh, in case if the patient or the parent is not not able to reimplant the tooth the situation now warrants that you should uh, ask them to store the tooth within within uh, some storage or physiological medium the best medium which has been recommended is milk so if if you can advise them you advise them to store in milk because milk is available almost everywhere and that has been uh, advised till now there have been many researches which you'll be talking about about the storage media but nothing is much better than than what you can have uh, milk at your disposal and then lastly it is that that you they should be seeking some help for the medical or the dental emergency uh, in the emergency room so first and foremost what happens if the primary tooth gets avulsed so avulsion like you can see it's the complete disarticulation or exarticulation of the tooth from the socket so management protocol here is that the reimplantation should not be done and what iadt 2020 guideline says is there is a higher risk of uh, aspiration of that particular loose tooth if the tooth is there inside and it gets aspirated it can lead to medical emergency which is life threatening so that's that's the evidence which we that's a consensus because there is still no evidence regarding the success of the reimplantation of the avulsed primary tooth and whatever we have it's all from the case reports or case series so low level evidence says that you need to rely on consensus of the different specialist and the specialist tell you that it is not advisable to to do the reimplantation instead what you should be doing is you should reduce the sources of infection you should reduce the source of the bleeding take the radiograph make sure that the tooth has been accounted for sometimes the avulsed teeth they are actually the intruded ones they have gone inside or sometimes the tooth can go into the respiratory canal so you might require some medical help you might require some uh, chest x ray in case the tooth has not been found by the parents and then second is the patient or the parent instruction they should be advised for a soft diet they should be advised for cleaning the area using torexidine and brushing of the teeth 
and then you, they should also be advised for the sequelae of the long term sequelae of the primary tooth uh, emergence. So that's that's uh, the effect which are going to have on the permanent teeth. So the follow up protocol for the primary dentition uh, remains the same. It's around say about around six months of the follow up, and then followed by a year of follow up. Uh, you should ensure that the tooth, if it, if the parents uh, want want some aesthetic rehabilitation. You have appliances like Groper appliances, uh, which are banded, or you can even use a Maryland using um, the fiber splints. If the patient uh, or the parent is patient is cooperative, you can use the, use that as an aesthetic option for 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 some period of time because it's it's a loss of anterior teeth, and then you need to restore the confidence of the patient back. So that's that's the primary tooth trauma which you should be dealing in 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 terms of aversion. So the goal here is to prevent the adverse consequences rather than to restore the tooth back. So that has to be there in the mind of a pediatric dentist when you, when you are dealing with. So this slide here tells you about what can happen after the tooth aversion of the primary uh, dentition. So most commonly, these are known as long-term sequelae of primary tooth trauma, and you can have as severe as odontome-like malformation. So it depends upon the age of the child patient. It depends upon the severity of the trauma. It also depends upon the maturity status of the tooth bud. So if the tooth enamel formation has just started and the patient is around one, one and a half years of age, so then it can lead to severe malformations while the patients who are uh, of an of a older age group, maybe six years where, where the tooth is about to fall, then the effect upon the permanent dentition will be more related to the roots or, or almost negligible root, uh, effects will be there. So we have a paper in dental traumatology, which is the largest cohort uh, in, in terms of long-term sequelae. That's the paper which came from our department. And that paper was cited in the IEDT guidelines 2020. And that actually highlights the importance of anticipatory guidance uh, for the patients, uh, when, for the parents, because you should be telling them that they are, they are supposed to be brought to your operatory uh, when the new teeth or the permanent teeth are erupting around six years of the age. So now moving on to permanent teeth. So for the permanent teeth, if you'll be observing, so the basics is to, to push the tooth back into the place where it was and to ensure that it, that it is there like this. And then once it has been there inside, you should use a splint. So it's as simple as that. No, no rocket science. It's just the basic physiology. It's the, just understanding what are the tissues you are dealing with. And you are actually dealing with the living tissues. And you should reduce the chances of infection. You should reduce the chances of morbidity. And you should always consider that you, it's a live patient. It's a whole patient you are dealing with and not just the anterior teeth. So that, that those things should be kept in the mind. For all causes, uh, the, the IADT guideline divides the entire treatment protocol for uh, adverse permanent tooth into two scenarios. The one scenario is where the tooth apex is closed, and the other scenario is where the tooth apex is open. So by closed apex, for those who do not know or who are the medical specialists, it's about the maturity of the root. So root gets closed around 10, 10 and a half years of age in, in almost all the races in the world. So if, if the child patient is around eight years or it's around, uh, around nine years, you are supposed to have an open apex or immature apex, which is still requires some physiological phenomena for the root formation. While the patients who are beyond 10 years of age or 11 years of age, those patients are generally uh, having a closed apex and, do, and, and their protocol is different. So now for each of these two scenarios, there are further three scenarios, which is number one, the self reimplanted, where the patient has uh, himself pushed the tooth back or the parent has to push the tooth back within 15 minutes or immediately. Then second scenario is where the tooth has been preserved in, in a storage media for 60 minutes, within 60 minutes and has been brought to your operatory or brought to the dental operatory. And third, third is there, like the situation which I showed in my case, where the they were the extra oral dry time is more than 60 minutes. So these are the three main main scenarios which we are dealing with. So for for the best case scenarios or the self implanted scenarios for close effects, the first and foremost thing is you are not supposed to disturb it to a greater extent. What 2020 guideline adds on is if there is a situation where the tooth has been implanted but the position is not right and you have checked it radiographically, you, if you do it within 48 hours, again, 48 hours is the time limit which 2020 guidelines tells you 
that if you if you reposition it by by your hand or by your instrument and reposition it into a normal situation it's allowed and and then you can do the protocol which is required for the for the things but you can correct the position within 48 hours that's what guidelines in 2020 say which was missing in 2012 you should you should clean the area you should remove the foreign body reduce the chances of infection do the do the suturing of the wounds in the in the soft tissue because these these injuries are also affected with uh, gingival lacerations and you should splint the teeth like i showed for for the case in the beginning the wire and composite splint should be placed and the guideline says that it should be placed for two uh, two weeks the endodontic uh, treatment for the permanent teeth with closed apex is mandatory you because there is almost zero chance for these teeth to revascularize so you are supposed to start the pulp extirpation do an excess opening remove the pulp tissue place in calcium hydroxide or corticosteroid and place that for four weeks and then you can ensure that the, everything is fine the tooth has been inside the oral cavity for a longer duration then you can obturate so the so the the, the guideline tells you or, or your clinical judgment tells you that your extirpation should be done within seven to ten days again seven to ten days your pulp extirpation for the core close effect should be done and that's that's normal endodontics which you should be doing what what the 2020 guidelines adds is that for all endodontic treatment you should be using rubber dam you should be using a split dam you should be um, placing the dam rubber dam clamps in the teeth which are unaffected and then you should be using your floss for for attachment of the clamps uh, for for the dam in in that particular tooth so that's the best case scenario the self implanted and here the goal is to re-establish the periodontium um, uh, chances that the, re the revascularization is negligible, but you can ac actually place the tooth back and periodontium can heal. The second situation is where the extra oral dry time is, is uh, less than 60 minutes. The tooth has been preserved. The treatment protocol is similar to what I showed you uh, in the beginning in that case, that the tooth has to be cleaned and that the periodontal ligament should not be removed. If the tooth has been brought within 60 minutes, the periodontal ligament is still viable and you can save the tooth's periodontal ligament by placing it within the saline and removing the, um, any of the debris. The 2020 guidelines do not ask you to place it in any of the loose surface biomodification or any other uh, medicament. And you can place the tooth back inside whatever root canal treatment has to be done or endodontic treatment has to be done. It has to be done within seven to 10 days. That is within, within the time period of your sprinting. You can place the tooth back, you can place the wire and composite sprinting, and then you can leave the patient there uh, for two weeks. You leave the sprint there for two weeks, and then within seven to 10 days, you, you remove the pulp, place in calcium hydroxide and add the form paste. The emergency instructions for the patient instructions is to reduce the chances of re-injury, avoid the contact sports. If the patient is a boxer, you should avoid that. He should avoid a boxing for next month. So you, he can he can have some convalescent period where, where the tooth can be allowed to heal. So radiograph can be done, positions can be ascertained, and then further endodontic protocol can be managed. The treatment protocol also involves a follow-up. So for all cases of tooth avulsion, the follow-up protocol is like two weeks, four weeks, three months, six months, one year, and then yearly thereafter for five years. And you can even follow the cases for longer than five years of period. That's what has been uh, uh, emphasized in the newer guidelines. So now moving on, the goal here is again, because the periodontal ligament is viable within 60 minutes, the goal is here to, to restore the viability of the periodontal ligament or to reestablish the periodontium after the injury. So in worst case scenarios, what happens if it is beyond 60 minutes? So if it is beyond 60 minutes, like the case which I showed, your aim is to remove the periodontal ligament. Again, to remove the periodontal ligament from the root surface. And when you are doing it, you should avoid causing any damage to the cementum. You should remove the periodontal the ligament, ensure that, that the patient's antibiotic prophylaxis and thickness prophylaxis is there, place the tooth back. The 2020 guidelines do not ask you to do a root canal treatment prior to the implantation that was there in 2012 guidelines because they say that if you do a root canal treatment, you are delaying the treatment or delaying the reimplantation. And there can be some, some foreign bodies like uh, gutta perca or there can be foreign bodies like calcium hydroxide or zinc oxide, eugenol, which can be there on the root surface, which can cause foreign body reaction. So in the cases where the periodontal ligament has been lost, we are actually looking at ankylosis. We are hoping for ankylosis. And if the patient is beyond 12 or 13 years of age, it's quite quite uh, reasonable to have ankylosis because the, the growth of the alveolar socket has, has uh, retarded. 
while in cases where the where the children are young it's it's a difficult proposition so the, so when we move on to the open apex or the when the children are beyond be, below 10 years of age so we see that the, 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 the there is a high chance of devascularization so the only difference where we which which it has from the previously discussed scenario of the close effects is that your endodontic treatment should be done only if you find chances of pulp necrosis so if you find that the tooth is discolored or there is a sinus or there is a mobility or there is a, a spontaneous pain you should go in and perform your endodontic treatment which is removal of the pulp and then treat it like an open apex case like you do for your apexification or apexogenesis or revascularization you can do it but then you should be doing endodontics only when there is a there is a chance of a pulp necrosis which has taken place. So that's the bottom line for all treatments for immature permanent teeth. If the tooth has been brought to you in 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 stored in a storage media, here the treatment part is again that you should you should preserve the periodontal ligament, place the tooth back, ascertain the position of that particular tooth uh, if, if within the within the um, the alveolar socket, take the radiograph place the sprint there, the sprinting time period is two weeks and the sprinting protocol is the same which I discussed before. You should give antibiotics, choice of antibiotics is amoxicillin. The previous 2012 guideline talked about use of tetracyclines or doxycyclines. But here in this guideline, they say that the first, first line of drug is always amoxicillin. And then you should, you should be focusing on the age of the patient when you are prescribing any sort of tetracycline drug. And then uh, as, as and when you are following the case, you should be looking at uh, the advantages of having a revascularization done or revascularization achieved or there is a sign of pulp necrosis. If there is a pulp necrosis, then you should be doing your endodontic treatment. Otherwise, you should be just following the case. In, in the worst of all the scenarios, it's the open apex case which has been brought to you beyond 60 minutes of time period, here you are supposed to, re to remove the pulp because in these cases, the periodontal ligament has has go has been uh, uh, necrosed and the pulp is also beyond 60 minutes. So there is a very less chance that, that the tooth will survive or the tooth pulp will revascularize. So your goal here is removal of the pulp. So what 2020 guideline again says that you place the tooth back and then in the, in the healing period, within seven to 10 days, you remove the pulp. So that's your clinical judgment. As per the guidelines, you are supposed to perform endodontics only inside the oral cavity under double dam and you should be doing it as far as possible uh, in your own practices. You remove the pulp and then treat the patient as an um, uh, like an open apex case. In these cases, since the periodontal ligament is not, not viable because it's beyond 60 minutes, you are all hoping for ankylosis. There are methods like decoronation and other things which we'll be talking in our clinical cases which are important. So this is what the guideline talks uh, talks about. So we should now be moving on quickly into what are the adverse consequences. So once you are done with your root canal, uh, do, do, done with your reimplantation of the adverse permanent teeth, what should you be hoping not to happen? So these are the adverse consequences. So first of the adverse consequences, which has been reported in the literature and the science is inflammatory external root resorption. So inflammatory external root resorption is primarily related, related to two factors. Either it is because of cemental tear, because the tooth has been fallen into the ground and into the foreign body, or when you are re-implanting re -implanting the tooth into the socket, you are pushing it too farther or you are pushing it with pressure. So you can cause some mechanical damage or there is some infection into the pulp of that particular tooth. So that's why it's very important that you should remove the pulp from the, all the mature permanent teeth. And whenever it's a chance of pulp necrosis or a sign of pulp necrosis, you should remove the pulp from the immature permanent teeth as well. If you remove the pulp, if you do not remove the pulp, what happens is the trauma to the periodontium increases the chances of uh, activation of the osteoclast and that leads to external inflammation root resorptions and then if there are toxins within the pulp canal because of the pulp necrosis they further aggravate the situation and there are certain molecular pathways which are activated and which lead to osteoclastic activity or and then the entire root surface is lost you will observe that it happens so quickly that if you have re-implanted within a month there will be there will be loss of or denudation of entire root surface and we'll be showing one of our failure cases with a similar proposition. Then moving on to another adverse consequence, which is ankylosis. Ankylosis is a replacement resorption. So in replacement resorption, that the bone gets associated 
actuated or attached to the to the root surface and uh, slowly slowly the the body removes all the cementum and and the dentine from the root and it's lost its causation is very similar to inflammatory root resorption but here there is a chance that the blastic activity will increase and they, if you clinically observe ankylosed teeth do not have mobility they will be uh, in a in a reduced uh, position or a, a infra occlusion if you talk about from the adjacent teeth there is a loss of lamina dura there is a dentine merging with the bone and that's a problem which is happening so if you go into into the depth of what is the pathophysiology for this phenomena there is a trauma to the prodontion almost identical to what happened with inflammatory root resorption trauma has occurred to the prodontium activation of the class has occurred replacement root resorption has happened but then there are molecular pathways which cause activation or differentiation of osteoblast so if osteoblasts are act, uh, are activated they they occupy the spaces of the os odontoclast or osteoclast and then there will be more of the bone formation and the tooth will be merging with the bone so these are the two most dreaded or unpredictable phenomena so so now once you know what are the guidelines and once you know what what wrong can happen so you should be now focusing on on certain clinical protocols or certain tips which which as a clinician you can perform and you can achieve reasonable amount of success with iadt principles so first and foremost is systemic antibiotics so so the the research has shown that systemic antibiotics especially amoxicillin it has got some role now uh, because tetracycline has been associated with the discoloration of the permanent teeth so you cannot use them in in younger children so you are supposed to use amoxicillin and that's the first line of drug giving a prophylactic antibiotic reduces the chances of infection and reduces the chances of um, of the of um, uh, adverse consequences to happen and then second is pulp extirpation like i mentioned that's again a clinical tip you should keep in mind when you, you should be doing excess opening and when you should be uh, removing the pulp so as of now the guideline says that you should remove the pulp within 7 to 10 days uh, of your reimplantation and then you should replace it uh, the the pulp canal has to be replaced or refilled with calcium hydroxide um, um, powder or the or non setting calcium hydroxide has to be placed inside or you can use a calcium hydroxide aqua paste which is available in most of the uh, of the brands in dentistry the calcium hydroxide is a very good material uh, it has got certain uh, certain properties which is antibacterial and it raises the ph of the dentine which reduces the chances of osteoclastic activity so it's a good material and it for a time period of 4 weeks which you are which is usually recommended uh, after reimplantation it does not cause the problems which are associated with it like like anti inflammatory properties or cervical um, resorptions or the problems of cervical fractures they do not have and in four weeks so you can you can safely use and uh, calcium hydroxide there are other medicaments which are available in united states of america and australia which is primarily <clears throat> the corticosteroid based medicaments and then they are used uh, popularly in those countries so if your country allows your you to use cal corticosteroid so you can you are free to use it so the bottom line here is remove the pulp remove the chances of inflammation and place in some material which is which is um, anti inflammatory so that that's mandatory so then a, a, a quick thought about the about the preservation of the periodontal ligament viability so preservation of periodontal ligament uh, ligament viability is in the hands of the parents or the individuals who have been traumatized because they can save the tooth so there there are medias like the, uh, the hbss or saber tooth media which Which is which is there having a very high uh, level of preservation properties. While there are other medias which are commonly available like bovine milk or the cow's milk or the buffalo's milk, ORS, the, which is rehydration syrup, egg white, they have been tested. So for all practical purposes. you should be aiming in in doing some of the uh, some of the awareness protocols or awareness programs for for the people so that they can store the uh, diverse tooth in the milk milk is available in almost everywhere in all parts of the world and that should be um, uh, documented and advised to the to the people who are who have faced the aversion so we also did a research which was presented in 2018 san diego conference of uh, iadt which is world congress of dental traumatology and and we we won an award for it but that award is of no use if we are not able to increase the awareness of the common people we can do researches in our laboratories we can do anything we want to with advanced facilities but unless and until the people who are there in your society who are who are able to afford it and who are able to you to know that the tooth has to be preserved in in the milk uh, the, your research is of 
no use. So you, you all who are listening to me today, they should be focusing on increasing the awareness for uh, for trauma or for preserving uh, for preservation of the root, uh, uh, the, the periodontal ligament. There is again an aspect of root surface treatment. In 2020 guidelines, this this part has been removed. They, they say that root surface treatment should not be done. And they cite a reason that the root surface treatment does not have a scientific evidence. So the people who are working in clinical dentistry, you should take this as a clinical uh, research area so that if you are able to generate evidence, you can convince the people that there are certain uh, modalities which are available for, for re-implantation to be successful. So that will be interesting to see in future. So that, that's one thing. And then splinting of the adverse permanent teeth, like I mentioned uh, in all the guidelines till now and in all the clinical cases which they showed. So the the, the wire or the, the the thickness of the wire which is recommended is 0 0.4 millimeter stainless steel and it has be it has to be cured using light cure. So that's that's one thing which has been recommended for by the IADT. In the recent guideline, they say that you, you can also use nylon or the fishing line, the, the line which is used for the fishing. So that can be used if it is if it is to be uh, used for a permanent tooth avulsions, but but the 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 modality we should not be used is this this arch bar. So oral surgeons who are listening to this presentation, you should avoid using arch bars in avulsions. You use it for maxillofacial trauma or even dentoalveolar trauma, dentoalveolar patches if if there are less number of teeth. But for all practical purposes, you should not be using this in, in re-implantation or splinting of the adverse permanent teeth. So that's a no, no, complete no-no. So then briefly touching about the decoronation procedures, that's what guideline tells you that if there is an avulsion of the tooth and re-implantation has taken place, which is followed by uh, ankylosis, there is a procedure called decoronation. And that decoronation means that you are supposed to remove all the pay, all the enamel from the from the uh, from the from the root surface which is there in in the alveolar socket you should remove all the foreign body like in this case we remove the gutta perca and then we placed in uh, the trip by antibiotic paste so that we can reduce the chances of infection then we we, we seal the but we induce the bleeding and we can close the close the flap so that's a decoronation procedure the advantage of this procedure is that you are preserving the height of the alveolar bone if you try and remove the roots like this what you will be doing is you will be causing damage to the to the labial cortex and you will be causing uh, a, dam a redu reduction in the height of the alveolar bone. So that has to be prevented um, when you are trying to do patients of uh, 10, 12, or 14 years uh, where the implants is not a possibility. Like in this case, we used fiber reinforced composite uh, and then we, we uh, restored the tooth using uh, using a composite free and composite and th that's that's how you should be doing uh, in the growing patients then there are certain problems which are unique to the places like india kenya uh, asian countries which have less access to the healthcare there are, there are problems because these cases are uh, are reported to us with a delay. They do not come immediately. They come once that the, once that there has been a delay of 12 hours or even more. Some of the cases even come um, um, once for rehabilitation when they they grow up. So those are the situations which are there. There are there is a gross problem of quality of life because people are are busy with their livelihoods. They are busy earning money and and feeding their children, uh, restoring, uh, safeguarding their families. So the quality of life with dental trauma sometimes takes a backstage. There are speech issues with the children, psychological issues. And as a dentist, you should make the patient or the parent aware that they should come for the follow-up. They should, they should ensure that the follow-up is done so that you can improve the quality of life of the, of the uh, traumatized patients. I'll be taking maybe 10 minutes more of, uh, of the time allotted because um, there are certain clinical cases which need to be shown. Uh, so the last part uh, for the for for all theoretical purposes is the management of the premature tooth uh, loss. As a pediatric dentist, and since I'm talking to Kenya Association of Pediatric Dentists, uh, we need to uh, be slightly uh, innovative when it comes to rehabilitation of the teeth. So if you if you have a patient who has got um, uh, a closed arch where, where the teeth uh, of the adjacent spaces, uh, they have closed in and there is no space available. You should seek the help of the orthodontist and you should create a space before you can restore the tooth. Or you can use the, the uh, appliances like this, the, like the one which is shown in this figure, where the bands can be placed on the permanent molars, and then you can have an arch and you can attach the acrylic segment uh, over that particular um, uh, the edentulous region. So that's that's a form of rehabilitation. There can be other things like uh, like natural contacts or the fiber reinforced which which are available to us. So now, as I end uh, my presentation, I will be showing you some of the success and failure cases very quickly, and we will be just. Uh, um, uh, 
touching upon what was the treatment done so this is this is a case of aman so so this is this this boy reported to us in around 10 years of age and he was a male he had a he had a version of two teeth the four one and four two the mandibular incisors lateral and central incisor they had gone and there was a crown fracture of three one so the injury had occurred and the patient had reported with a with a prolonged extra oral dry time so what we did since it was an after hours emergency what we did we did the reimplantation we placed uh, the with the fiber the the wire composite is pinned and then we we followed the the it with the next ray next day so it's the next day where we took the x ray everything seems to be fine and then what we observe in the follow up is that the resorption has started and then we when we try to um, to undertake the protocols for external root resorption which is removal of the pulp and placement of the calcium hydroxide we could not do much we lost a um, substantial amount of the tooth uh, in the next sitting which which you can see that within 3 months of um, of the reimplantation there is a loss of substantial amount of the tooth structure and the bone in the region and when you when, when we just just followed the patient further and further because we could not do anything except for for the waiting for the tooth to go because it's still a, a patient of of a younger age group and then we see that they within a, a year and a half almost all the tooth root and the, and the bone the region is is affected so the problem here was that we did not adhere to the pulp extirpation protocol so we all have cases like this in our closets where we we have committed mistakes and we we try to hide them but it's actually a good form of learning to learn from your own failure cases we did wrong because we did not extirpate the pulp from the mature tooth if if you do not extirpate the pulp from the mature tooth you are going to end up with with something like this which is not a good thing so this this should be kept in mind in future for all all uh, of all of you who are listening to me so this is another case sunaina another female uh, who was affected by a road traffic accident there was a version of 21 and the treatment was done very well by by another colleague of ours uh, in a private clinic but then the patient did not turn up patient did not go for the follow up and when it comes to us this is the day one radiograph which we access from the from the um, pediatric dentist in the private practice and this is the 10 months the patient did not report patient did not report to the to the to the dentist who had done the reimplantation and if you will observe within 10 minute 10 10 months the body has eaten the entire thing so that's that's the criticality of removal of the pulp or the importance of the follow up our adherence to the iadt guidelines 2020 which you should be doing it in your parts of the world in future so so that that's that these were the two failure cases and some of the success stories to boast of from our divisions so this is a delayed reimplantation the patient was brought with an extra oral dry time of more than 2 hours the the tooth was placed inside then the fiber the, the then the 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 composite bias printing was used and then if you see the radiograph this is the day day one and then this is uh, this is three months follow up and this is again the six months <clears throat> nine months follow up and you will be if you compare the tooth that there is almost a, a, a slight radiolucency which you will be observing on one of the central incisors which can be a transient uh, apical breakdown or or some transient radiolucencies if we when we followed it up further almost a year and a three months you will observe that the that the the lumen of the pulp canal is closing down that lumen closing down means that the pulp inside is trying to wall off any of the insert it's called as uh, the pulp canal obliteration which is a positive sign which that, that's what iedt guidelines also tells you that if you find a sign of pulp canal obliteration that means that the that the pulp is live that the pulp is vital and it is going to survive and when we followed it up that's the latest follow up which we had in october 2019 and you will observe that the that the lumen of the pulp has closed in and that there is apexogenesis the tooth apex was open and now it's reimplanted after the extra oral dry time and it is surviving so that's a success story and that's because we adhere to the to the guideline and we we just waited and waited sometimes as per the the dental traumatologist in the world jens andreas and 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 the people like him so what what they say is there is more trauma when you cause there, there is more trauma you cause in your treatments than than you can by waiting Thing. sometimes you should wait for for the appropriate time period to call, to to do a treatment so that that's a bottom line you should be keeping the biological prince principles in your mind always so that's again a case uh, of a delayed uh, reporting there was a reimplantation and then the tooth has gone off then the, then uh, what we did that's a decoronation procedure we removed the enamel we induced bleeding we closed the flap and then after that we we did a fiber reinforced again a, a, a bridge there in the anterior region and that's a 6 months follow up the roots in these cases they merge 
they 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 undergo ankylosis and we will be ending up with a substantial boot quality of the bone in the region so that you can do your dental implants or your prosthodontics later on so then last of the cases it's an interesting case because uh, i i always love to talk about it it's 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 a case of unusual situation that the, the girl had had a had, a, had an aversion when she was playing at near her home and because she was afraid that if you, if she will tell about uh, the, about the loss of the tooth to the parent she actually reimplanted it and when she reimplanted it herself she did not tell anything to the parents and when she came to us she was around uh, um 13 years of age that was 5 uh, years after the trauma has happened so the tooth had been reimplanted by herself never told to anyone not visited any dentist and i don't know how it survived but it survived and after 5 years we we see the thing which is there on the left side of your screen which is an abscess so when we took a radiography we we saw a huge lesion so that huge lesion was was extending uh, to to a, a pi score of around 5 So it's indicated for surgery in most of the re, most of the uh, oral surgeons and endodontists will go for a microscopic surgery. But the patient did not want the surgery there, and we thought that we should go ahead with principles of regeneration and we should try non-surgical regenerative procedures. So that the what we did we did a CBCT, and you will you will observe CBCT here in all the views. You will observe that there is a huge lesion in this in this part. The buccal cortex is almost thinned, and there is a pressure on the lateral incisors also. One interesting finding was right there at the at the apex of the of the reimplanted teeth where there was a, a a calcified structure there in the apex as if that somebody has done an mta barrier there but it was never been opened never never touched by any dentist so what happened next was that we we did the access opening and as we did the access opening we removed the the, the necrotic tissue from there induced the bleeding uh, and then we we did the irrigation protocol we completed we disinfected the tooth and we placed the triple antibiotic paste for two weeks after two weeks we placed in the the, the calcium hydroxide aqueous solution aqueous paste there and after 6 months we saw that there was uh, some bone formation so that's what guideline says that unless and until you see that there there is a reversal of resorption uh, happening you should not be doing your obturation so you place the calcium hydroxide for a longer duration in in cases where in cases like this and after 6 months we were we were we were very confident that we will we are on a right track so we placed the mta uh, in the entire root canal space and after placement of the mta we followed the patient up it's one year follow up and you are seeing that almost all of the radiolucency is gone so that's a pre operative that's two weeks that's six months and that's one year and you can see the substantial change and when we compared the occlusal radiographs that's the huge radiolucency the 5 pi score and that has almost vanished so that's the principle or the beauty of following the protocols and doing the regenerative protocols for your own trauma patients and that's the patient after one year uh, follow up we did a repeat cbct because we wanted to do orthodontic treatment for this patient um, because she had crowding and she she wanted it to be healed uh, so so when you when you compare from a pre operative uh, cbct you will observe that the pressure on the lateral incisor is almost gone it has gone, it has moved back into the position there is a sound bone which is there and it it seems like a miracle but it's just the principle of science which we are doing so if you compare the two cbcts just just see the difference the see the difference in the quality of the bone which is there you hear the and and that bone gives you satisfaction because as a as a pediatric dentist you have uh, saved the patient from from the surgery so that's a reconstructed uh, image from there and and you will observe that the bone is healthy so as of now the patient uh, is now uh, under orthodontic treatment and fix orthodontics has been advised for her it is being done by our orthodontic colleague so that that's the status so so the, the the good thing which we did in this patient was we did the decompression we we did uh, uh, disinfection and then we placed in calcium hydroxide and then we placed with mta based regeneration protocol so that's the basis and then that that's the soul of this presentation that anybody who is listening to me from any part of the world you should keep in mind that 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 it's not rocket science it's not something very expensive like dental implant or something which is very um, very skill specific it's basic dentistry it's basic dental traumatology and if you are doing something something good for the patient you will be happy about it and 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 one thing like i mentioned for for dental awareness or the awareness for dental trauma you should you should uh, consider cases like this this is saira and she she fell down from motorcycle and the and the medical medical doc 
doctor uh, who attended in the ER, he, he or she did not know about reimplantation. So the patient was not advised for reimplantation. And when she came to us, she came to us after five days. And she came to us with a tooth like this wrapped in a, in a, in a newspaper or a textbook paper. So you cannot do anything with, with, with a tooth like this, with so much of blood clot, with so much of the of, of a lost body part it's like losing a finger of yours so would any any of you would like to, to have a finger lost no so why why such of uh, such apathy with with teeth so that's 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 our onus on all the dental professionals and pediatric dentists that we should increase the awareness of the people towards traumatic dental injury management which they can do and and uh, like uh, iadt always says you should always go to this app. This is a Tooth SOS app, which is free of cost. And it was primarily designed for the patients. There's a separate column for the patient and the operator. And you should go there. You should, you should explore more. And uh, you will find your own trauma situations right there. So on your mobile phone, on your smartphone, you can access that. So that's free, of course, you, you could use. And, and in, since it's a COVID-19 situation, we in India, and, and, and I think that the Indian society and the African society, they are almost very similar. So, so in, in, in India, we are fighting a, a different sort of pandemic. We are seeing that there is an increase of the child abuse and, and the female abuse, uh, which is rising. And there is a helpline number, which, which government of India runs. And that helpline number, is receiving calls for the child and domestic abuse and mind you that when that domestic abuse is happening they are going to have certain dental injuries and which can even lead to tooth avulsions so you should you should try and do uh, something about recognizing the child abuse and and uh, domestic abuse if you can and that will be a great service to the society so that that's that uh, brings us to the end of the presentation. And, and one tagline for all the tooth avulsion automatic dental injury management, which I always love to share with you is that to win the war, to win the war in a battle or in, in the real time war situations, which, which uh, is very unfortunate, you have to have the right strategy in place. You cannot just go there with your army and then, then win the battles. You have to strategize which, which troops are you going to use, which, which arsenal you are going to use. And that's why when you are trying to manage uh, a tooth trauma or tooth aversion, you should be prepared with any strategy because victories don't come by accident. They do not come. You have to be prepared to, to face the situation. And with this, I would uh, I would like to end my presentation. I, I would be happy to interact with any of you in, in any of the social medias on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Or you can email to me here in this uh, email ID. Uh, over to you um, for the questions. Excellent. The Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nitesh. Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Perfectly. All Thank right. So I'll start with the question and answer. First, the ones which you have answered, I'll actually just answer so that we go quickly. Um, there's a question about an example of antibiotic corticosteroid paste that should be used. I saw you talked about leather mix, so that's okay. Then there's a question on what type of milk, powdered or liquid, evaporated or non-evaporated, fresh or synthetic. Just comment about the type of milk so, the so, patients can store. That, that's a very practical question because then you, you should be knowing which is the best media. So there is a paper in dental traumatology which talks about different types of milks and their viability. So it says that uh, uh, a high fat milk, uh, which is liquid is, is the best media which you can use. So rather than using an evaporated milk and, and mixing water and then again wasting time on it, if it is available within your home or household, the milk packets or tetra pack, which is available. So liquid milk is the milk which you should be recommending. Okay. Any comment on the temperature of the milk? The cold milk is the better one. Uh, you should not be boiling it or waiting for it to boil. If it is there in the refrigerator or it, if it is at the room temperature, it's perfectly fine. You, you should not be going into something, doing something additional. Use whatever is available to you. So if you are recommending uh, something you can use from the refrigerator or from the home. Excellent. Thank you. There's a question on sodium fluoride. I think you covered that that it should be um, 2% and the tooth should be soaked yeah. in for 20 minutes. You also talked about, yes, 
Go ahead. There, there's a catch. There's a catch now um, because 2020 guidelines have removed any of the recommendation for roof surface wire modification. So 2012 guidelines talk that 2% sodium fluoride for 20 minutes should be recommended. But right okay. now what we hear in 2020 guideline that since there is no evidence of any benefit from sodium fluoride uh, application or roof surface bio modification, it's recommended that you do not use it. You can re-implant directly. So that, that's one major change in the guideline which has come about in 2020. Uh -huh. Thank you. So the wire you talked about a 0 0.4 millimeter stainless steel or 0 0.016 nitri, is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Somebody asks, what do you mean by flexible splint? So uh, earlier there used to be some confusion that there used to be term like rigid splint and semi-rigid splint and flexible splint. But right now all the dental trauma literature either talks about rigid splint and flexible splint. So by rigid splint, we mean that any splint which reduces the chances of physiological mobility. In your tooth and mine teeth right now, we are having some mobility. If we try to move, there is physiological mobility which is always there. So any splint which reduces the mobility is rigid splint and any splint which allows that mobility is flexible splint. So wire and composite splint, the nylon splint, these are all, uh, all splints which, which allow the normal movement of the tooth. So that's why they are important. Okay, thank you. I think that is now clear about what is a flexible splint. There's a question here uh, that says, I'm confused. In the beginning, it was said you do extraoral root canal treatment. Yes. Now you say we do intraorally at all times. Kindly clarify. Yes. So, so that's a difference from 2012 IADT guideline to 2020 guideline again. So in 2012 guideline, it, it was very clearly written that if the extra oral dry time is more than 60 minutes for immature and mature permanent teeth, you are supposed to do an extra oral extirpation of the pulp. You can remove the pulp extra orally and you can place in calcium hydroxide or corticosteroid or you can even do your obturation using your gutta parka. That, that's what 2012 guideline you talked about. But very recently when the new guidelines came, they said that uh, if you are doing your uh, extra oral extirpation of the pulp or you are doing placing some, some material like calcium hydroxide or corticosteroid inside, Actually, you are trying to delay the placement of the tooth back into the in, into the alveolar socket. So that time has to be minimized. Even though it is beyond 60 minutes, then also you should try and, and minimize that, that time period. And an additional thing which has been said yesterday um, by, um, by uh, Ashraf, it was, it was told that, that they, they considered the, the, the use of uh, rubber dam for all cases of uh, pulp extirpation and the time period was to seven to 10 days after placement of the tooth back into the socket. The reason behind is that if there is some medicament like calcium hydroxide or maybe some zinc oxide eugenol paste which, which gets stuck onto the root surface, that can act as a foreign body and that can reduce the chances of uh, uh, proper adhesion of the bone to the tooth. That's what we are looking at. Thank you for the clarification. Another question. What is the guideline for using chlorhexidine rings in children under the age of 12 years? Is it recommended? So for, for guideline for general oral hygiene purposes within with below 12 years, it's recommended. Uh, it's recommended in the patients who have got some uh, gingival disease and periodontal disease. But for dental trauma, when you are trying to minimize the, uh, the source of infection, because infections, when they go into the gingival crevice, they can further lead to inflammatory root resorptions and further adverse consequences. So your um, exceeding rinsing is re recommended. And even in cases, if you would be surprised, majority that that in cases of uh, primary to uh, trauma, uh, what the 2020 guidelines tells you is that you should be using um, chlorhexidine as a topical agent. So you can use cotton uh, swab or you can use a gauge piece. You can dip in cold chlorhexidine and you should use it to to wipe that particular area. So that that is that is the recommendation to reduce the oral bacterial load. So that 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 answers that question that. Codexidine is actually recommended below 12 years of age. 
Ah, thank you. So I think that just the whole idea is to be able to give the patient yes. instructions, not to swallow, but it's very useful yes, in uh, in uh, its bacteriocidal and static effects. Okay, there's a question here. You had mentioned that before implantation, the periodontal ligament should be removed. Can you explain the physiology of how the tooth will remain secured in place without this ligament? And also, what instrument can be used to remove the PDL? So, so uh, you are not supposed to remove periodontal ligament in all the cases. So in the cases like you saw, uh, where the patient has self reimplanted it, or the reimplantation has taken place within 15 minutes. So that means that the periodontal ligament is right there inside. So you are not supposed to take the tooth out and remove the periodontal ligament. Similarly, in the cases where the patient has been brought to you within 60 minutes and the tooth has been stored very well uh, in a physiological media like saline or maybe in, in, in the bovine milk, uh, if, if, you, if you know that the periodontal ligament is okay, then you are not supposed to touch it. You're not supposed to even even touch the root surface. That's that's the uh, importance of periodontal ligament because if it is inside, the normal tooth periodontium can be restored. While in cases which is beyond 60 minutes, where you can imagine that you saw the pictures of those average permanent teeth in my presentation, two of them, that they were having blood clots and the entire periodontal ligament was dry. So you imagine a dry periodontal ligament, if you, if you do not remove it completely and you place it, that dry periodontal ligament will be a source of foreign body reaction. Body will recognize it as something which is not natural. And then there will be necrosis, there will be external inflammatory root resorption, and you will lose the tooth. So, so what you do is you remove the periodontal ligament. Recommended method is by the use of gauge piece. You, you wet the periodontal ligament, you use a wet, wet gauge piece, and you just slightly wipe it out, wipe very gently holding the tooth with the crown. And as you wipe it out, do not cause any damage or external damage to the, to the cementum. The use of Gracie curettes have also been recommended by 2007 guidelines, but there is very less of the literature which compares the, the, the two methods. For, for all, all practicality in our center, we use a gauge piece for removal of periodontal ligament. And if you do that, you are reducing the chances of uh, any um, uh, inflammatory root resorption to take place and you are allowing the ankylosis to happen. That's how the tooth is retained, uh, like you mentioned in your question. Okay, thank you for that. I think it's important what you have said that PDL is not always removed. So you've got one has got to look at the situation of the trauma, the extra oral time, whether it's been reimplanted or not the root status and then make a decision based on the scientific evidence available whether it's a suitable case or not Perfectly thank important. you when do you obturate avulsed teeth after endodontic therapy so for that uh, the guidelines tells you that uh, you should be obturating uh, after four weeks if uh, within four weeks of placement of calcium hydroxide or your um, corticosteroid you are observing that there is no sign of external root resorption. Or there is no sign of which is which can alarm you for any adverse consequence. You can you can uh, obturate very easily, and this is this is done directly um, by in, in mature teeth. While in immature permanent teeth, you should wait. And if the pulp necrosis has, has happened and you have uh, removed the pulp and placed in calcium hydroxide, you should perform either. Uh, MTA, uh, apical barrier technique for apexification. You can do your calcium hydroxide apexification or you can do your revascularization protocols. So you should be follow doing it after you have observed the patient for one month. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question on decoronation. I'll come to it after a short while. Let's go to this one of, of is there any effect of having the splint in place for six weeks? Uh, what sort of effect uh, you are looking at, it's more important. Uh, the, the guidelines tell you now in 2020 that for all the cases of avulsion, your uh, spin should be placed for two weeks. So earlier they used to talk that if extra oral dry time is more than 60 minutes, whether immature or mature, your splinting time period should be four weeks. So, but now they have, they have removed it. They have removed it and said that it's two weeks. But as a clinician, sometimes when you, when you are doing a patient and you see that there is still some mobility and you have taken care of all other causes of mobility, then you can even remove it. You can leave the sprint for a longer period. 
uh, but but keeping it there unnecessarily doesn't doesn't uh, make any sense if it is recommended for two weeks and you are finding that the mobility is all right and the tooth is functioning well you should remove it uh, the detrimental effect of having a longer duration is on on the periodontal ligament it can lead to some periodontitis some gingivitis which can happen to this okay thank you Another question, how does one splint a valve, for example, let's say you have a valve 1-1 one, one or 2-1, and then the 1-2 two and 2-2 two, two are not yet erupted. How, how do we splint? We have 1-1 one, one and 2-1 are valves, 1-2 and 2-2 two, two not yet erupted. So uh, here, here the situation is which you are talking about is, is quite practical, and thank you for that question. For there, you can use your primary teeth for your uh, anchor. So if permanent central incisors have averged, there is no lateral incisors. So we are talking about somebody who is around eight years of age. You have a strong primary canines. You have primary molars. So sometimes we even have used primary molars because you are looking at a time period of two weeks. So within two, two weeks, you won't be causing any damage to your primary teeth because you have splinted it. It will not cause any ankylosis. So you should be keeping in mind the, the number of teeth which have gone off and number of teeth which are strong enough to hold them in place back. So that, that's the guiding principle. You can, you, you can use primary canines and molars for splinting. Okay, so we use what is available and make what a good decision. Okay, we'll come now to um, the question on kindly explain decoronation, the rationale and procedure. I, I think maybe you will just have to summarize because yeah, it's a sure. whole, it's a, it's a, so just a yeah. summarize on <laughs> decoronation rationale and procedure. Okay, so decoronation procedure was given by, by, by uh, some of the scientists, Barbara Malgram to, to name one. So Barbara Malgram and discovered this procedure in, in uh, 1980s. So the procedure goes like that in the cases where ankylosis has happened and the tooth is in infra occlusion and the adjacent teeth, they are in normal occlusion and you are left with uh, the with, with, uh, option of either extracting that particular tooth or doing something which is anesthetic. So what she's, she did in her patient, she did a flap. She removed the flap, uh, opened the flap up and then she removed the crown portion of the of the tooth and then what she did she removed all the enamel from the bone level so everything was removed till the bone level the the, the root canal is placed there it was uh, um, remain it was kept patent using a file and when you move a file inside there will be some bleeding like we have for revascularization you induce the bleeding and as soon as the bleeding gets induced you do not put anything else on it you just close the flap you just suture it as soon as you close the flap, uh, what it does is in, in the next coming years, since the tooth was already undergoing ankylosis, uh, the entire bone will be deposited over the root surface. The root surface will slowly merge and it will disappear. The biggest advantage or rationale behind decoronation is that uh, in the patients where they have um, um, age group, in the, in the age group of uh, within 10 years or within 12 years uh, where there is less of the uh, treatment modalities like dental implant available to you, you are preserving good quality bone. If you imagine extracting a tooth which has been ankylosed, you need to cut the bone. And when you will be extracting it, the labial cortex will be gone. The lingual there will be some fracture in the lingual cortex. And when resorption of the bone will happen, the adjacent teeth and the bone level here will be having at least four to five millimeter space. So anybody who knows dental implants, to establish a four to five millimeter space in the anterior region, it's really a hell of a job. And you need multiple surgeries and grafting. And then also you will not be able to preserve the bone. So decoronation preserves the bone. And we now these days, we even use it for the, for the patients like you saw in my case. We use it even in the cases which have got poor prognosis. So if the root is there and it is, it is not going to survive, we stay that particular root, we close the flap and we do the aesthetic rehabilitation. We wait for a normal bone to form. So bone formation is the ultimate rationale of the, of the decoronation. And you should read the books of Barbara Malgram. They are, they are very beautifully done. And she has also a very good cohort, cohort before. Uh, she, she finished the, the, those, those patients. Okay, thank you very much. The coronation is definitely an interesting topic eh? with, with quite a bit of uh, information coming out. Um, I have a question on um, what is the prognosis of applying orthodontic treatment of an avulsed 
tools. Dr. Nitesh, I'll take just two more questions and then we wrap it up. Okay. Okay. For the prognosis of applying orthodontic treatment on an avulsed tooth. So, so there is no direct guidelines from IADT for orthodontic management, but there have been a couple of papers in Journal of Clinical Pediatric Dentistry and IJPD, which talks about um, the timing of uh, orthodontic treatment in all traumatic dental injuries. So by rule for all traumatic dental injuries, as minor as uh, um, subluxation to as severe as tooth avulsion, you should be waiting for, uh, for at least six months. For all cases of tooth avulsion, so the recommendation uh, from our research group is that that you should be waiting for at least one year. If they, if you have re-implanted the tooth, you should ensure that there is no sign of external inflammatory root is option or any sort of ankylosis before you can think of even think of doing orthodontic treatment. But like you saw in the last case. In the cases where there is a root resorption and you have managed root resorption very well and then uh, the, or, or re-implantation had taken place and then you you, you are seeing that in follow-up of uh, six months and one year, nothing has changed and everything is going fine. Then you can initiate your orthodontic treatment. It has got fairly good prognosis if everything is has been accepted by the body. By accepted by the body, I mean that that body is not trying to treat it like a foreign body. So, so that, that's an important thing as a clinician, which you should be keeping in mind when you are trying to do orthodontics. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, we are just going to the last question. There are so many questions. Unfortunately, we have to close down by 8.30. Um, so our final question for the evening is, does the use of vasoconstrictor in local anesthesia affect prognosis of the implanted tooth? So uh, this is a question which has been um, again uh, put into our research area by IADT in 2020 guidelines. So in 2020 guidelines, if you download it, it's free of cost, you can do it. So if you download it, uh, there, is a, there is a last part in tooth aversion which talks about the future areas of research. So use of local um, um, use of local anesthesia with vasoconstrictor or without vasoconstrictor, it's debatable. So there is no evidence as of now which can which can say that if you use local anesthesia with vasoconstrictor, it will cause poor prognosis of your re-implanted adverse permanent tooth. But the consensus of the experts which developed the guidelines, they recommended that local anesthesia without vasoconstrictor should be used. And that's primarily related because um, we, are, we are trying to have as much blood supply as possible. And having a vasoconstrictor will reduce the blood supply in that particular um, uh, adverse permanent tooth region. So, so that's, that's, the, that's the guideline in 2020, which talks about no vasoconstrictor. Although they also say that it's a future area of, of, of research, so which should be taken uh, into account. So, so okay. that is one thing. Okay, thank you. So we need to do research on whether to use vasoconstrictor or not. So I'll just take two last questions because <laughs> there are so many. Allow me. So Dr. Nitesh, comment about splinting time when you have multiple avulsed teeth. And then the second thing, what is the probability of ankylosis after reimplantation? Those are our last questions. Thank okay. you. So if there are multiple avulsed teeth or an avulsed teeth with, uh, with um, um, other injuries, because injuries do not happen alone. They happen with, uh, with multiple um, injuries happening together. They can yeah. be some subluxation or some dentoalveolar fractures. So, yeah. so here in these cases, your primary aim should be to, to, to preserve the most severe form of injury. So since all the, among all the dental trauma, the tooth aversion is the most severe form of injury. So you should be targeting at managing dental trauma first. So if there are two teeth, like in, in the cases which you, show, which you saw in, in my presentation, so you should be, they, they were all managed together. It's not that I implant one tooth first and then the other one. And in the case, in the case which there was a implant, where there was an aversion and a crown fracture, which was complicated. So we first did the reimplantation and then we splinted it and then we preserved the pulp uh, using our uh, pulp procedure. So, so your timing should be dependent upon the number of the injuries and the most severe form of the injury. So that should be attended and uh, all the reimplantation should be done together. So one uh -huh. after the other uh, and you should not be waiting for longer duration. Like the question on, on probability of ankylosis. So there is a high probability of ankylosis and in the cases where there is a delay of, um, of more than 60 minutes 
hoping for ankylosis to happen is actually good thing. So if you if you have ankylosed uh, in a, in a patient of around ten years, and then you still have uh, around eight years um, to before you can do your uh, normal implants, you can have a normal tooth in place which is functioning very well, which is better than any of the space maintainers. And then with time, as the patient moves to 10, 12 or 14 years, and if there is an infra occlusion, you can do procedure of decoronation and you can um, you can preserve the bone. So doing reimplantation is mandatory for all cases if there is no healing which has happened. If the patient has been brought after five days or six days and there's a heel socket, there's no point of doing doing a reimplantation. Uh, but but in the cases where you can do reimplantation, please reimplant the adverse permanent. Uh huh. Thank you. So ankylosis may happen, but for yes. the time being, we reimplant as we wait to make decisions when the child is older and we preserve the bone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nitesh, for a very um, interesting presentation, very nice pictures. We could just follow the sequence by which you replant it and, and the time factor, which sometimes we forget, and even the role of teamwork. We appreciate your time and effort in preparing this. Um, to our participants, the guidelines, please go to the Dental Traumatology Journal. We have the um, International Association for Dental Traumatology website, which also has the guidelines and a quick reference manual so that when you have a patient with trauma, you can make a quick reference and be able to make good decisions. Like he said, we need the strategy, we need science, not luck. So let's utilize the resources available in order to make better decisions. So we are wrapping up the CPD. I wish to thank the, my co-panelists from the um, from the KAPD team. Uh, we have Dr. Gishu, Dr. Kere, Dr. Njama, and Dr. Munyao. Thank you very much for supporting the session. And ladies and gentlemen, do have a good evening. We will have another CPD in a week or two. So do look out for our alerts and. Uh, Dr. Nitesh, thanks again, and we look forward to hearing from you on a different topic. Have a good evening. Awesome.